Welcome to the second module, Advanced Physical Activity Planning of the Knowledge Mobilization Training Series. In this final section, Coping Planning, we will look closer at coping planning and how it can be a useful tool to assist individuals in following through with their action plans for meeting the physical activity guidelines for adults with spinal cord injury. What is coping planning? Coping planning entails the pairing of anticipated barriers with strategies that people can use to regulate their behavior when these barriers arise. In essence, forming coping plans allows people to anticipate a potential barrier that may interfere with their physical activity and perhaps increase the likelihood of participating in physical activity under such threatening situations. When we use the term barrier, we are often referring to things that deter people from translating their good intentions into behavior. That is, from steering people away from participating in their activity plan. Some examples of common physical activity barriers for persons with spinal cord injury include lack of time, lack of transportation, pain, low motivation for engaging in physical activity, and decreased social support for engaging in physical activity. Some barriers may be more relevant to some people than to others. The important thing when discussing possible barriers that may prevent clients from engaging in physical activity is to have clients be able to identify barriers that are personally relevant. Coping strategies refer to things that people do to resist the temptation of not engaging in a behavior due to the occurrence of barriers. There are many types of coping strategies that one can use to help keep them on track of their physical activity plans. Some common strategies include self-talk. Self-talk is a cognitive coping strategy that's used to overcome disruptive thoughts and feelings. It refers to statements that we make to ourselves and can be used to increase confidence, regulate arousal or emotions, and focus effort in order to overcome high-risk situations. Another example of a coping strategy is visualization, or more commonly called mental imagery. Visualization is another type of cognitive coping strategy. It refers to seeing and feeling an experience in one's mind. For example, one may picture themselves engaging in a bout of physical activity, such as swimming, and imagine themselves having fun and being calm during the workout and feeling refreshed post-exercise. By visualizing the situation, an individual may become motivated to actually exercise even though they may feel too tired to exercise at that particular moment. Our last example of a coping strategy is that of self-monitoring. Self-monitoring is a type of behavioral coping strategy where an individual pays attention to their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors engaging these against some sort of standard. Self-monitoring may involve individuals using a diary or a log to keep track of these feelings and behaviors. Researchers have found that people who use coping strategies to manage high-risk situations have greater self-efficacy and are less likely to have physical activity lapses or breaks than those who do not use such strategies. As we also saw in the first section, where we discuss the research on coping planning, people who supplement their action plans with coping plans are far more likely to be physically active than those who only form action plans alone. Essentially, forming coping planning is part of staying on track with one's physical activity routine. Now that we know what coping planning is and the types of strategies we can teach our clients to use to overcome barriers, let's discuss how we can get clients to form a coping plan. There are four essential steps to forming a coping plan. In step one, we have our clients identify relevant barriers and obstacles that may interfere with their action plans. Step two involves working with the client to outline a strategy to be used to help cope with each barrier or obstacle. Step three, once a strategy is formed, we have the client read over each coping plan and try to visualize the situation as well as their planned actions. And at step four, 
we ask the client to make a firm commitment to act as planned. Let's take a look at some sample coping plans. Recall from the previous section on action planning this sample action plans. You can see that on Sunday, the individual planned to engage in wheeling around the block in their neighborhood at 7 p.m. for about 20 minutes at a moderate intensity. On Monday, they plan to have a rest day. Tuesday, they plan to engage in strength training activity, specifically focusing on their chest and their arms at home using resistance bands at 8 p.m., where they believed it would take about 20 minutes and they wanted to exercise at a moderate resistance. Wednesday was again another rest day. Thursday, the individual planned to go swimming at the local pool at 7 p.m. for about 20 minutes at a moderate to vigorous intensity. On Friday, the individual then planned for their second set of strength training activity, this time focusing on the back and core muscles at the local gym at 8 p.m. for about 20 minutes of a moderate resistance. And finally, Saturday, they planned to have a rest day. Using the sample action plan, we're going to walk through each of the four steps of forming a coping plan. In step one, we have the client identify relevant barriers or obstacles that may interfere with their action plans. In this particular step, we want to make sure the individual identifies relevant barriers. So some barriers that may potentially be relevant to our clients may be things such as unforeseen appointments, doctor appointments, or other healthcare professional appointments, muscle soreness or pain, and fatigue. Once these barriers have been identified, they then move on to step two, where the individual outlines a strategy to be used to help cope with each of the barriers that they identified. It's important at this point to have the individual identify solutions or coping strategies within their means. Here are some examples of coping plans for each of the barriers that were highlighted in the previous slides. For unforeseen appointments, the individual may, may make a coping plan saying that if this barrier tempts them to not exercise, they plan to reschedule their activity session immediately after their appointment. For the barrier of muscle soreness and pain, a client may form a coping plan such as if this barrier tempts them not to exercise, they plan to avoid certain activities that may aggravate the pain and or modify the activity so it does not cause any further soreness or pain. And finally, with the barrier of fatigue, the person may plan to remind themselves that the best medicine for fatigue is fresh air and that they'll feel rejuvenated with a wheel outside. So these are examples of some possible coping strategies that may be used to overcome such barriers. In steps three and four, we ask the client then to read over each coping plan that they have formed and try to visualize the situation as well as their planned actions. At this point, we also ask them to make a firm commitment to act as they planned. Clients may find it useful to post coping plans where they'll see them, such as on their fridge, in their phones, or by their bedside. The key is to be prepared with a coping plan if the barrier arises. Now that we've discussed the four essential steps to forming a coping plan, you may be asking yourselves, what are some questions that I can ask my clients to stimulate discussion on forming realistic coping strategies? Here are some questions that may get you started. You may ask your client, what motivates you to be active? You may also ask them, what type of support networks do you have? And this is really important when identifying many of the coping strategies for barriers that may arise. Another type of question you can ask your client to stimulate discussion on forming realistic coping strategies is what type of support do you require to assist you in meeting your action plans? Or you may ask them how do you cope with barriers in other aspects of your life as these coping strategies may be useful to help them to cope with barriers that may arise with their physical activity. In summary, coping strategies are most effective when they are detailed, when one familiarizes themselves with them, 
for example, posting them on a fridge or in their phones, when one is able to visualize the coping strategies that they will use in a particular situation, when coping plans are realistic or that they are within one's means, and finally, there's some element of self-evaluation. This may involve having clients evaluate how well they have been able to implement the coping strategies. For example, you may ask clients to use a rating scale where 1 equals unsuccessful and 10 equals complete success. And the individual is then asked to evaluate how effective they were able to use each coping strategy. This type of evaluation may help clients identify the most effective coping strategy that they can use within their own means, as well as strategies and or situations in which they may require further assistance to help them carry out their action plans. This concludes the final section of Advanced Physical Activity Planning within the Knowledge Mobilization Training Series.